The listless movement of spirit, which no longer creates a distinction within itself, has thus entered into its own self beyond consciousness, which, on the other hand, sees itself clearly. The first movement of this clarity is determined in its necessity and condition by the fact that pure insight, or insight that is implicitly notion, actualizes itself. It does so when it posits otherness or determinateness within itself. In this way, it is negative pure insight, that is, a negation of the notion. This negation is equally pure, and thus there has come into being the pure thing, the absolute being, that has no further determination whatever. Characterized more precisely, pure insight, qua absolute notion, is a distinguishing of differences which are no longer differences, of abstractions or pure notions, which are no longer self-supporting, but are supported and distinguished only by the movement as a whole. This distinguishing of what contains no difference consists simply in the fact that the absolute notion makes itself into its object and posits itself as the essence over against that movement. This results in the essence being without that side wherein abstractions or differences are held apart and therefore becomes pure thought in the form of a pure thing. This, then, is just the listless, unconscious movement to and fro within itself of spirit to which faith was reduced when it lost a content that contained a difference. It is at the same time that movement of pure self-consciousness for which the essence is supposed to be the absolutely alien beyond. For because this pure self-consciousness moves about in pure notions, in differences that are not differences, it collapses, in fact, into the unconscious movement to and fro of spirit, that is, into pure feeling, or pure thinghood. The self-alienated notion, for the notion here is still standing at the stage of this alienation, does not, however, recognize this identical essence of the two sides. The movement of self-consciousness and of its absolute being does not recognize their identical essence, which is, in fact, their substance and enduring being. Since the notion is unconscious of this unity, absolute being has value for it only in the form of a beyond, standing over against it, while the consciousness making these distinctions, and in this way having the in itself outside of it, is held to be a finite consciousness. In paragraph 574, we are now entering a new sub-portion of this Enlightenment section. This one is very short and is called the truth of the Enlightenment. So the question we have to ask is, well, what is the truth of the Enlightenment? And that is something that we've already started to see, right, in the development, in the struggle of the Enlightenment with superstition, which turns out to be about the Enlightenment and its, its uh, views on and, and critiques of faith, and some of the responses that can be made by faith to, to Enlightenment. At the end of that section, faith has, has essentially lost the game, and now Enlightenment, or pure insight, dominates the field. And so the question is, well, what is the truth that it possesses. And, and what you see in this, this very metaphysical beginning paragraph, which is quite long, uh, really can be boiled down to saying that what we're talking about here is a self-alienated notion in which spirit, as he says, goes to and fro. It doesn't really have something to latch on to. And why, why is that the case? Because, again, to use a phrase that, that Hegel has brought up uh, many times, what we're dealing with at this point, not, not across the board entirely, but at this point, is a distinction of things that should be determinate without a real difference between them. And so in order to have truth of enlightenment, we're going to need difference, and that requires otherness. So let, let's walk our way now through what it is that he's saying. So he talks about this listless movement of spirit no longer creating a distinction within itself. He says it has entered into its own self beyond consciousness, which on the other hand sees itself clearly. So we already do have a distinction there, right? The spirit on the one hand and consciousness, which is going to be self-consciousness, understanding itself as finite. And he says the first moment of this clarity is determined in its necessity and condition, 
by the fact that pure insight or insight that is implicitly notion actualizes itself. Okay, so what, what does that mean? What is the first moment of that? The first moment of this is, um, you know, the, the, the spirit, right? Which, which is going back and forth. And he says, pure insight or insight that is implicitly notion, implicitly concept, implicitly something that connects things together actualizes itself. And again, a very common Hegelian point in order for the, the rational or the ideal to be what it's supposed to be, it has to become actual, it has to become wirklich, right? It has to uh, engage itself in, in the world, in a project. It has to become practical. So he says, how does it do this? Here's a key Hegelian point. It does so when it posits otherness or determinateness within itself. Over and over again in the Hegelian dialectic, we're, we're going to see that in order to become real, in order to engage the world, in order to have projects that mean anything that you throw yourself into, there has to be alterity, otherness. There has to be a kind of splitting. And this can take many, many different forms. It can be the difference, realizing the difference between means and ends. It can be, you know, thinking about the nature of another self-consciousness and your relation to it. It happens in, in a myriad different ways. But this is really fundamental to the Hegelian dialectic. Without this, there is no advance. So the, 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 the key then is, in some respect, to get the right kind of other, although sometimes you don't have much of a choice about that, and then to figure out how you bring them together. How do you get past? How do you reconnect them? So he says, in this way, it is negative pure insight, a negation of the notion, a negation of the concept. This negation, <clears throat> he says, is equally pure, and thus there has come into being the pure thing, absolute being, the pure thing. Absolute being as something that just is. Right Now, he says that this is part of what happened through the Enlightenment. And we're going to see how this gets worked out in later paragraphs. He says, this has no further determination whatever. We saw that earlier. Characterized more, more precisely, pure insight as the absolute notion is a distinguishing of differences which are no longer differences of abstractions or pure notions which are no longer self-supporting but are supported and distinguished only by the movement as a whole. So we have a distinction being made, but it's not a distinction that is going to be particularly workable or useful for self-consciousness. So what should it do then? How should it manage this? Well, he goes on. He says, um, this distinguishing of what contains no difference. So we have here again, a distinction but it's not really a distinction in the fullest sense. A distinction, when we make a distinction, like say between means and ends, means are different than ends. How are they different? We use this word difference quite a, quite a lot too. <clears throat> this is worth dwelling on. <clears throat> when a difference really matters, you have some way of articulating how these things are fundamentally different from, and maybe still connected with each other. There is a contrast there. What would be the opposite of that? Imagine a paper where you're just filling in, you know, schemas of means and ends and you're not really thinking about it and you're just sort of plunking things down in there as if they're, they're you know, uh, homework for you to do. Busy work, as we say. That's a distinction without a, a difference. So he goes on and he says, um, it consists in the fact that absolute notion makes itself into its object and posits itself as the essence over against that movement. So the absolute object is going to make it, the actual absolute notion is going to make itself into its own object. And we're going to see that this will involve subjectivity. But for right now, we have this polarity of the pure thing, right? And then we have the consciousness that is actually trying to make sense of this. So he says, that the results uh, are in the essence being held without that side, wherein abstractions or differences are held apart, therefore becomes pure thought in 
the form of a pure thing, absolute being. Then he says, this then is just this listless unconscious. Notice what he's saying there, unconscious. We're talking about consciousness. It's the phenomenology of spirit or mind, which is the development of consciousness. We have some unconscious things going on here. So he says, uh, it's, 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 uh, here we go. It, it's um, the unconscious movement to and fro of spirit. And he says, what does this degenerate into? Mere feeling. Mere affectivity. Um, pure thinghood. Then he says the self-alienated notion, for the notion of standing at the stage of this alienation, of being opposite, of being alien to itself, does not recognize the identical essence of the two sides. It doesn't recognize that self-consciousness and absolute being are in fact part of the same movement. You could say that the, the self-alienated notion, or spirit if you like, is not aware of itself. It's just, you know, reacting. It's just understanding. It's developing, but it's not taking a conscious guidance of that. So he goes on and he says, um, the movement of self-consciousness, as absolute being, doesn't recognize their, their identical essence, which is their substance and enduring being. And he says, since the notion is unconscious of this unity, absolute being has value for it only in the form of be beyond standing over against it. While the consciousness, so the, the real thinking going on this side is on self-consciousness side. Um, the consciousness making these distinctions and having the in itself outside of it is held to be a finite consciousness. So what we have here is a sort of division that's taking place and we don't have anything yet overcoming that. That's going to happen as we move through this section. So the truth of self-consciousness, or the truth rather, of enlightenment is something yet to be realized. In regard to that absolute being, enlightenment is caught up in the same internal conflict that it formerly experienced in connection with faith, and it divides itself into two parties. One party proves itself to be victorious by breaking up into two parties, for in so doing it shows that it contains within itself the principle it is attacking, and thus has rid itself of the one-sidedness in which it previously appeared. The interest which was divided between itself and the other party now falls entirely within itself, and the other party is forgotten. Because that interest finds within itself the antithesis which occupies its attention. At the same time, however, it has been raised into the higher victorious element in which it exhibits itself in a clarified form, so that the schism that arises in one of the parties and seems to be a misfortune demonstrates rather that party's good fortune. Paragraph 575 really sets the tone for what is going to be taking place in the rest of this section, more than the, the preceding paragraph, I would say, in part because what Hegel is, is doing here, he says that in, in regard to that absolute being, right? So we've got this polarity of absolute being and self-consciousness. And with regard to that absolute being, he says, enlightenment is going to split into two, two different ways of looking at it, two different parties. This is incredibly important. And so I would say there's, there's probably more going on in this short paragraph than there was in the longer paragraph preceding it. So he says, in regard to that absolute being, enlightenment is caught up in the same internal conflict it formerly experienced in connection with faith. So what was the, the conflict that it, it experienced in terms of faith? Faith and pure insight were both forms of thought and both of them were trying to sort of share the same space, but unable to do so. And insight was, in a certain way, the negation of, of faith, which itself contained some negations within it, as, as we saw as we went through it phenomenologically. Now that faith is no longer there to function as a foil, can enlightenment simply say, all right, we won, let's get on with our project, no, because inevitably what it finds once it no longer has that, that opposition to something else and starts 
working out its own projects and looking more closely at itself and at its objects. It's sort of like saying, oh, you know, well, I thought everything was going to be great and simple once we got this, this, this crazy pain in the rear person out of the house. And now the house is so quiet and you start looking around and you're like, oh, I never noticed how dusty things are in here or that I, I never unpacked all those boxes or, you know, that uh, maybe I don't like being by myself and you start talking to yourself. I mean, this is very metaphorical, but that's what's going on with enlightenment. So he says enlightenment divides itself into two parties. And here Hegel, you know, is telling us something quite interesting. One party and he's using the word parte there, right? So sort of one faction, one, one, one grouping, proves itself to be victorious when it breaks up into two parties. And this is often the case in politics, right? We see a successful party that comes to so dominate the scene uh, that its opposition really vanishes. Is going, it's probably going to split into two parties and become two different entities, how? By emphasizing different principles. And each one can represent it this way, that it is the one party, it has a principle, and there's another principle that it's attacking that the other party represents. And, and both of them you know, can, can view things in this way. So why is this important? He says the same thing, enlightenment, contains within itself the principle it is attacking and it's rid itself of the one-sidedness, Einseitigkeit, right? Which it, in which it previously appeared. So in a way, you could say enlightenment couldn't really be what it was and display its own inner contradictions that it has to work through while faith was still dominating the scene or at least you know, presenting a rear guard action that it constantly had to fight against. Once enlightenment takes over the culture, enlightenment can start splitting into enlightenments, or at least different interpretations of enlightenment. Again, something really great to keep in mind for the contemporary defenders of enlightenment. There is no one single enlightenment thing that everybody from, you know, Bacon all the way through Kant were, were all involved in. They didn't agree on everything, right? And it's very, very important to be clear which enlightenment we're talking about. Not just to, you know, because if we're not, then we're doing what Hegel calls picture language, you know, or Vorstellung, representation, or even worse, just appealing to feeling, gefu. And that's not enlightenment at all. Enlightenment is about working out the concept conceptual thinking, able to take its opposition into itself and not be one-sided. So he says, the interest, and he uses this word, you know, interest here, um, which was divided between itself and the other party, now falls within, ent entirely within itself. The other party is forgotten. Faith has, is no longer the real issue. Because why? That interest finds within itself the antithesis, the gegensatz, between the two parties, between the two principles, which occupies its attention. Culturally, the Enlightenment stops focusing on attacking faith and starts focusing on trying to figure out what the hell the world is about and how to fix it and what to do. So he says, at the same time, it's been raised into the higher victorious element in which it exhibits itself in a clarified form. So the schism, the splitting, right, that arises in one of the parties and seems to be misfortune demonstrates rather that party's good fortune. Who is the party here? The party is enlightenment itself as opposed to faith. So splitting into two is actually a good thing. It's going to bring out all sorts of matters that need to be clarified. The pure essence itself has no difference in it. Consequently, the way in which it does obtain a difference is that two such pure essences exhibit themselves for consciousness, or there is a twofold consciousness of the essence. 
Pure absolute being is only in pure thought, or rather it is pure thought itself, and therefore utterly beyond the finite, beyond self-consciousness, and is only being in a negative sense. But in this way, it is just mere being, the negatives of self-consciousness. As the negative of self-consciousness, it is also related to it. It is an external being which, related to self-consciousness, within which differences in determination fall, receives within it the differences of being tasted, seen, etc. And the relationship is that of sense certainty and perception. Paragraph 576 is telling us a little bit more about this dualism or duality within the heart of enlightenment that Hegel has been talking about for the past two paragraphs in this section. So he says that if we, if we think about it in terms of pure essence, or as he's going to say, pure absolute being, it doesn't have any difference within it. And we saw that what, what's really important here for the development of the enlightenment is that it does have difference within it. So how is this difference that we know is supposed to be there going to manifest itself? He says the way in which it does obtain a difference is that two such pure essences exhibit <clears throat> themselves for consciousness. And then he immediately says, or there is a twofold consciousness of the essence. So it's not as if there really are two distinct essences. There are two different ways in which consciousness is taking cognizance of this, this essence, and they're going to argue with each other and contest with each other during the, the period of the Enlightenment about which of them has it right. And, and, you know, the irony is, of course, they both have it right and they both have it wrong. In, in some way. So he says, pure absolute being is only in pure thought, or rather it is pure thought itself. So the, the pure essence can be understood as thought, but it's also grasped by consciousness through the modality of thought. So he says, this is therefore utterly beyond the finite, beyond self-consciousness, and is only being in a negative sense. That means that the thinking that is grasping pure essence as thought is in a certain way not fully adequate <clears throat> to it. Or you might say it's not able to entirely grasp what that pure thought is on that side. So perhaps the grasping it as a void was less a reflection of what's actually out there and more a reflection of the lack of capacity to fully understand it that uh, consciousness had on its side. And that's one, that's one way in which the pure essence is manifesting itself, in the modality of thought. So he says, in this way, it's just mere being the negative of self-consciousness. As the negative of self-consciousness, it is also related to it. So this brings us to the second way of understanding what is, what is going on here, what this pure essence consists in. We can picture to ourselves or you know, imagine or however else you want to talk about it, some sort of pure uh, thing that just doesn't have any predicates. It just is what it is, pure being itself, the absolute. But that doesn't work for very long. We need some ways to make sense of it. And we, we have to think about, well, if the, there's an absolute out there, what, what is all this stuff that we're seeing and hearing and smelling? What is the world? What is this body that I have? What is this chalkboard? Or, you know, you're looking at this through, you know, what's happening in, in a camera right now. Um, you're looking at it on some sort of screen. What is that? So Hegel says, to go back just a little bit, as the negative of self-consciousness, the absolute is the negative of self-consciousness, it is also related to it. Now here's where he brings in the second modality. It is an external being which related to self-consciousness within which differences and determination fall receives within it differences. And what are those differences? Here he says these are differences of being tasted seen, and so forth. 
Well, what are those? Those are modes of perception, of sense perception. So he says the relationship is that of sense certainty and perception. So what are, what are we seeing here? Well, remember back to the section that we just traversed and the enlightenment view on things, which was that the absolute is this void without predicates. And yet the world is this sensuous world. And now the question is, how do we reconnect these together? And what's going to be happening is there will be two different perspectives and these are going to be two different ways of understanding what it is that the absolute in fact is. What is the pure essence? What is pure absolute being? And how is it related to consciousness? One way is going to grasp it through thought and focus on it in that way. The other is going to grasp it through sense certainty and perception and grasp it through that. But both of them are attempting to, to grasp what the absolute is and how self-consciousness fits into that absolute. 